A little bit of news came out last night where a filing with a U.S. district court uh, by one of the prosecutors from the Southern District of New York uh, laid out that this uh, prosecutor had been in touch with the counsel for Arthur Hayes and his, his co-defendants. Hayes, notable as the founder of BitMEX, which was once a very prominent uh, options exchange in the Bitcoin world. Uh, he's been quote unquote, on the lam since last fall, uh, following an enforcement action by the CFTC and others. Um, so the little kernel of news that came out is that he may surrender in Hawaii in April, and he's been holed up in Singapore this whole time. So that was the news that dropped last night and was a, an interesting update to uh, a story that we've talked about previously. Uh, you know, we talked about that Vanity Fair profile that came out. I guess that was last month. Uh, this filing, I think, was dated the 16th, which was maybe about a week after that Vanity Fair profile. So maybe not all press is good press in the case of Arthur Hayes. Uh, I'm curious to see what you guys think about this latest development. Naomi, what's the word? What is the word? Um, I mean, I, I have such a soft spot for Arthur Hayes. It breaks my heart that law enforcement's after him because you, you, you're operating in this crypto world where the regulations are not clear. It's like this murky area and people are, they think they're outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. They're blocking IP addresses. They're doing what they can uh, to make sure that they're towing the line. They think they're doing enough. And then suddenly the long arm of the US law says, actually, uh, we're going to reach you over there and you weren't doing enough. And suddenly, you you know, there's a risk of jail time and all of this. I think Arthur has been such an outspoken, interesting figure in the crypto space. He really is going to go down in history as being one of the, you know, the most talked about, like most prominent people um, and one of the ones that we remember. You know, people come and go over the years. You watch a documentary like The Rise and Rise of Bitcoin and literally like every company they talk about, it no longer exists. Um, but Arthur Hayes, I think, is going to go down in, in history and uh, and be remembered. And so I, um, I hope that things work out for him. Um, if he surrenders, I hope that there's some sort of good deal there. I, I don't like to see innovators and entrepreneurs who are trying to provide, um, you know, options, financial options for people. I don't like seeing them get persecuted. Um, and I disagree with some of the, the um, problems that the law enforcement have with Arthur Hayes. So Ben, what are your thoughts on all of this? <laughs> well, shout out Nick Day for finding this one. Um, really interesting news, just moving this story sort of incrementally forward. And obviously at Coindesk, we're going to be following it closely. You know, I think this is really just a natural progression of things, right? Like, you know, my lawyers talk to your lawyers. Let's see what we can do. That makes a lot of sense um, in this instance. And I think that, you know, if those talks are progressing and there's a voluntary surrender potentially on the table, you know, that has some implications for what the sentencing or anything like that might look like. And maybe a little bit easier, but, you know, of course, we see this play out with uh, various kind of proxy entities in the U.S. government starting to, you know, work the streets, uh, maybe in some of these cases. So we'll see what happens. You know, if the case goes to court, I think, believe the filing said Hayes said he would come to New York for that, uh, for the trial phase. And, you know, I think that'll be really interesting because we'll get to see these arguments play out in real time rather than some of the, you know, behind closed doors negotiations going on currently. Yeah, the finally mentioned the proposed there. bail package. Um, sorry, you guys talking about... What are you talking about? Will, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I'm just wondering like, what was well. going through his head. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. what, I don't what know. do you guys think yeah. was going on his head? Because like this came out in October and he was in Singapore. He, like he's lived in Singapore for a while, and I think Hong Kong and other places as well. And I'm wondering what was going through his mind. He's also like a pretty devout skier. I know he goes to Japan a lot to go uh, hit some of the powder runs there. And I'm sure Japan and the US have extradition treaties, so probably meant he couldn't go skiing there anymore. Mm -hmm. Man, he probably couldn't go back to the U.S. anymore if he was like still on the lam. He had to live in Singapore like for the rest of his life. So I, I wonder if like the last three, four months was him just like contemplating what was the best move, like go to jail for a little bit or just like be confined for the rest of your life in one part of the, of the yeah, earth. I'm a ski info, Will. That was spoken was like really a true Colorado. I'm, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> yeah, that this, right? I'm glad that this ski angle made it from uh, from our Colorado correspondent, Will Foxley. That was big. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I don't know. The thing that I'm sort of trying to piece together in my mind is sort of like the 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 TikTok of events, right? We had this big Vanity Fair profile mm -hmm. that was, I think, largely flattering to uh, you know to to Arthur as a character in the crypto space. We had uh, there was that blog post where it's like I'm back and I'm blogging. Like there was that blog post, yep. and then I think the, I think in the time 
line in between those two things was this court transcript on February 16th. So I'm really curious about sort of like the timeline and how like Arthur was playing that out in his mind and sort of, again, the skiing opportunities that he was pondering or not um, <laughs> as it relates to the, the powder in Japan. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like, you know, BitMEX, BitMEX, I think as a platform is no longer like as huge a part of the Bitcoin market as far as, far as I understand mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think this does become sort of just, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what shakes out. If there is clarity around, you know, this enforcement action, maybe they are able to sort of put this behind them and, and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. take back a bit bit of the market share. But uh, Naomi, I know, like, I want to toss it back to you, just, you know, like implications toward Bitcoin trading and the Bitcoin market. Uh, do you see, uh, you know, do you see this moving anything? Do you see any factors there that we should be more mindful of? That's a great question. I ask this question frequently because I, um, I, I have a lot of trouble with having the United States dictate policy for the world. You know, their BitMEX wasn't available to US customers and yet, um, they're not allowed to have the policies that they want on their platform in case US persons can get onto it. So that, you know, it, it bothers me. Um, that that it is so pervasive that the United States just gets to dictate everything and everyone has to follow along. They are the most powerful government in the world and they do pursue people um, if they don't toe the line. So it kind of begs the, the question, like, what is sovereignty? What is an independent nation deciding their own policies for their own people? What is the choice in the world if we have one country dictating everything? It, it does make me worry, especially as the US, you start to see that maybe they are cracking down from a law enforcement perspective. We are starting to see these crypto wars. We're getting a lot of gag orders that are starting to be leaked through the channels. We're starting to hear more about this. So it it worries me how strongly they're coming down on this and whether this is going to jeopardize competition in the crypto space across the world. Because we've always said this is a global phenomenon. If we get shut down in the US, we'll always have other countries. I'm not entirely sure that that's uh, going to play out the way we think it is.